Okay. Greetings to you all. My name is Wendy Mazura, and I'm going to be taking you through the 2020-2021 summer season preparedness. So we are going to discuss various issues today, and going forward, we are going to narrow them down into particular crops and go down in detail with each individual crop. But for today, it's mostly a presentation where we are going to discuss the preparedness of the season, seeing as it's just around the corner. So this is just the housekeeping issues. The presentation is going to be shared after, so it's going to be recorded. And the PowerPoint presentation will be beamed, as you can see. Typed questions are invited, and the answers will be provided verbally at the end of the presentation, and we'll send through all the responses for the questions that we might have failed to respond to during the course of the presentation. The outline of the presentation is going to be as follows. We are going to start by looking by at the essential elements in agriculture production. Here we'll just look at the contribution that agriculture has in the gross domestic product and see how much we can contribute to improving and growing our economy and make our nation the breadbasket again. We'll then move on to look at issues to do with good agronomic practices, where we are going to look at soil conditioning first. We'll move on to look at land preparation as these move hand in glove. We'll then move on and look at planting dates, plant populations, fertilizer management programs, weed control, pest and disease control, organic matter, manure, and water harvesting issues, especially in light of climate change. Then to top it all up, we'll look at selection of crops and selection of the right varieties based on the region that you will be and based on your cropping program. Zimbabwe backbone is agriculture. So agriculture is important for us as a nation, which is why even during this COVID pandemic, we are seeing that the sector has been placed under essential services. Having said that, did you know that agriculture contributes between 15 to 17 percent to the gross domestic product. Yes, it does. And in terms of employment, the numbers are unbelievable of the people who are in the agricultural sector in the different value chain enterprises. Now, just to look at the essential elements that are critical for you to have a successful farming venture or as a successful agricultural production uh, program, to begin with, it's the genetics. Once you have the genetics right, it means you have the right material to be able to give you the desired characteristics and desired traits. The genetics need to be established somewhere. So we need growing media. Our main growing media is the soil. So we need to also take note of the fact that our soil is important. We need to take care of it for it to be able to avail its goodness and its richness to the crop for it to grow well. The other factor is the weather. The weather, especially in the last three seasons, as we have rightfully seen, has been very unpredictable. With a false start to the season, irregular termination of the season, premature uh, termination as well, and mid-season droughts. So you find that this is important for us to study and understand the climatic condition, seeing as the climate is um, dynamic. So we need also to understand where we are going so that we adapt, least we die. The last element, but in no way the least, is the management. The management plays a critical role because have you ever noticed that you can get the same implements, you can get the same inputs, but the output will be different. It all now boils down to the management issue. Don't underestimate the power of management in your farming enterprises. Your foot should be regularly in the field. You should be foot soldiers. This is the recipe for making your farming enterprise as profitable as possible. Moving on. There are a thousand reasons for failure in crop production, so much so that we can't even begin to state them. But there are only two main reasons that can make your farming venture profitable and make you successful. This is the selection of your seed, which is the right selection of seed, and coupling this with good agronomic practices for us to be able to unlock the genetic potential that we are expecting for the good genetics that we will have established. So going forward, I'm going to take you through the good agronomic practices first, seeing as it's a time for preparation. We need to make sure that we are on top of the situation, we prepare and we are not found wanting. So we go through the good agronomic practices first, then we'll put the icing on the cake 
by looking at the crops, the appropriate crops going into summer and the variety selection. To begin with, soil analysis and soil conditioning plays a pivotal role in your farming enterprise. Why? Because farming is a business. So you need to make sure that you take into account everything that has the potential to add value or reduce value to your farming enterprise. Did you know that pH can affect your productivity to the extent that where you apply, for example, 10 bags of fertilizer, only two or three bags can work, which is to say that is 20 to 30% of your input. So this means it's eating into your profit margins and the yield levels that you expect to get are not going to be reached. So you are going to incur a loss. So it's important for you to take note of the pH levels. And on your screen, you are seeing the pH level where you're seeing that at a pH level of, um, uh, just to say the green side means that that's the ideal pH that we require and the crop will be happy, the nutrients will be readily available, while the red zone, as the color red usually signifies, means that you're in the danger zone. So you're most likely to be in trouble in terms of the availability of the nutrients that you're supposed to get. So it's important for you to take note of that. As you can see, once your pH reaches 4.5, that's the side where I was referring to, where you are using 30, 23, 33% of your macro elements, which is your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, which is to say you are not even using half of what you will have applied. So what's the point? It's important for you to take note of this and make sure that you do the necessary amendments on time so that you become profitable. Just as a guide, the pH rates are guided by the soil that you have. So the application of lime will be guided as such. So the, in the surface soils, you apply 100 kgs for every 0.1 pH unit different that you find. In the sandy loopy soils, you apply 120 kgs in 0.1 pH unit difference, while in the clay soils, you apply 200 kgs for 0.5 pH units. Sorry, just admitting more people. While we do that, the other important thing that you need to take note of is the benefit that comes from liming. Liming is important because a well-conditioned soil will make fertilizer use efficiency higher and it will increase your productivity level. The optimum pH range for most crops will be between 5.5 to 6.5, which is to say once you have a pH range of 5.5 to 6.5 across the broad spectrum of crops that you can establish, you are most likely to have a high or optimum fertilizer use efficiency. Then just looking at the types of lime that are available on the market. This is quite interesting. And most farmers will allude to the fact that some of them think gypsum is lime, but we'll get to that. There are two main types of lime that you can find on the market. We have calcitic and we have dolomitic lime. Calcitic lime, as you can see on your screen, refers to calcium carbonate, while dolomitic lime refers to magnesium carbonate. And gypsum, as you can see in red, refers to calcium sulfate. There is no carbonate element in the gypsum, which is to say what lime can do, gypsum will not be able to do. So you'll only be able to avail calcium and sulfur when you are applying gypsum. But in terms of correcting acidic soil, you will not be able to achieve the same value that you're supposed to get from applying lime. So it's important for you to take note of that. Having said that, before we move on to the other issues, we find that there is a discordance in the time that lime is applied, especially here in Zimbabwe, where you find that once the season is started, once the rain looks like it's supposed to rain, the farmers are coming in, there's another person in front with the fertilizer, another one with the lime, the next person with the seed, another one covering. This is not the way to do it. The correct way to do it is to apply your lime well in advance of establishment of your crop because it will require between two, between three rather, to five months for it to be activated and be able to correct acidic soil. So please, dear farmers, take note of that. Moving on to the next issue. Sorry about that. The next issue is to do with land preparation. Land preparation is another very important issue to look at because if you fail to till your land on time, it means you are going to 
fail to get the desired results because your crops are going to grow within the soil profile, within the root zone. So it's important for you to make sure that you have the best land preparation method that you desire. So for land preparation, the most important thing is to make sure that you have conventional tillage or conservation tillage. These are the two main types of tillage that are available. But your choice will depend on your understanding of the two and what your, your desired result. It's important for you to take note of the fact that the world is moving away from conventional tillage and moving towards conservation tillage. Why? Because conservation tillage is a method that is seen to be sustainable for the environment, for the future generation to also benefit. So that's where we are going as well. So we need to also move with the time and make sure that we are being uh, smart in terms of our choice of operation. So for conventional tillage, you have to turn over the soil by using different implements. Either you're plowing, you're using a chisel plow, reaping, disking, rolling. But the disadvantages, like I've already stated, are the destruction of the soil structure, the increase in erosion, moisture loss as well, which is a key, a, a, a very problematic issue, especially now when you see that climate change is real. So you really need to conserve whatever moisture that you get to make your enterprise as profitable and as high yielding as possible. So now looking at the conservation tillage method, the important thing that you should take note of is the fact that there are three main principles that guide the conservation agriculture uh, method of farming. So these principles are minimum soil disturbance, which is to say you're only going to till the area where you want to establish your crop, where you're going to throw your seed. Either there are furrows, they have holes. So this is what you're supposed to do. The second one is soil cover always, which is to say there needs to be more than 30% soil cover on the ground to ensure that you are said to be using conservation tillage. So the other thing that you should take note of is the issue to do with um, rotations. It's important for you to alternate your crops so that you are reaping the benefits from growing different crops and get value out of that as well. So under conservation tillage, we find that Kumbuza is one of the methods that the farmers are using, particularly for the small scale farmers. This method, dear farmers, you need to accept and adopt because it's a method that's aimed at increasing in, and intensifying your farming program rather than you having an extensively large piece of land. Why not concentrate on a small piece and make sure that it's being as productive as possible. So that's where the concept of Buddha comes in. However, a common question usually comes whereby the farmers are asking, what if I first plow my land and then come and dig the holes? Dear farmers, once you do that, the whole purpose is defeated. So it's important for you to come and make sure that you are observing the principles of conservation agriculture. For the con commercial farmers, there are implements that you can use for uh, conservation tillage, but you find no till planter is there. It goes in straight and plants without even coming in with tillage. This is important because your ground cover is there, and you are also incredible on the organic matter that you need as well for your crops in the future cropping program. Moving on to the next slide. The optimum plant populations. It's important for you to note the optimum <laughs> plant populations that you should be using when you are establishing a crop. This is because yield is a function of two things. Yield is a function of two things. Yield per plant and yield per unit area. Which is to say, if you are going to be harvesting once in every, a plant in every meter, where you're supposed to be harvesting a plant in every 30 centimeters, there is a huge loss. So it's important for you to take note of that. The other important thing that you should know is the fact that you really need to understand the nature of your season. The nature of your season will enable you to make an informed decision in terms of your plant population. You need to be guided by the optimum plant population rates that are there because for them to be there, research has gone into them so that we get the optimum levels that are desired by a particular crop for you to add value to enterprise without eating into your profit margins. So it's important for you to take note of the fact that 
under ideal conditions, you can go for a higher plant population, but under uh, anticipated dry spells, you need to adjust your plant populations why, uh, accordingly so that you don't in introduce competition in, within your cropping program when the season is already unfavorable. So it's important for you to take note of that. The other most important thing is the issue to do with the different crops where you find that there are different cropping programs that have different plant populations that farmers can use. In maize, for example, the optimum plant population is from 50,000 to 60,000 pounds per hectare. So it's important for you to be guided as such, but you find that some varieties that are short stature are also giving you the advantage to establish at a higher plant population. So it's important for you to take note of the nature of the variety that you're going to be using for you to be able to add value to your farming enterprise. Moving on to the next issue of planting dates. Time of planting. When is it the right time? Do we ever really know when is the right time? Yes, we can be able to tell that this is the time when we can establish our crop. How can we do this? One of the main ways that we use and the most effective one is to work with what we call the effective rainfall particularly for rain-fed agriculture. So you find that with, from 35 millimeters onwards received within three consecutive days, two to three consecutive days, this should be enough for you to establish your crop. So farmers should be able to know the number of uh, the, the, the measurement of the rainfall that they have received. But this you cannot tell by measuring the number of runoff that is in the roads when you are traveling back home. Rather, you need a rain gauge at your farm. A rain gauge is the only certified tool to tell you the percentage of rainfall that you have received. So every farmer should get a rain gauge and it's quite affordable. So there's no excuse. You need a rain gauge and you need it this season and you need it now when you're getting ready for the season so that by the time it starts raining, you will not be found wanting. The altitude is also important for you to factor in. Say for example, you want to have a crop in March or April and establish your next crop Probably you're doing irrigation, you want to come in, but then you are growing your crop in region one or region two where the heat units are lower. So what it means is your crop will take longer to reach maturity and it will affect your next crop. So you need to be guided by the heat units that your area gets, the region that you are growing your crop. And this also has a direct effect on the growing degree days. So it's important for you to be guided accordingly. Also of great importance is the fact that 40% of the heat units that our crops uh, use or during the season is received from October to December, which is to say the first half of the season is the period when we get the highest heat units. And the crops require the heat units to grow well. By heat units, we are just referring to the, the warmness of the air that, that uh, allows for the crop to photosynthesize well and grow as effectively as possible. So we get very high heat units from October, November, right up to December. So this is the time when if irrigation allows, you can establish your crop and be able to be a leap ahead of others and catch your next cropping program. So this is the advice that I would like to give you. As you can see on the colorful chart that you are seeing on your screen, different varieties have different maturity dates. Also, it differs based on the altitude, which is the, the height above sea level. So you find that where it's higher, the, it's cooler. So it also takes longer for the varieties to mature. Where the ground is lower, it tends to be warmer. So it also increases the growing degree days and the varieties will mature much earlier. So it's important for you to take note of that in the different maturity groups from the 400, 500, 600, and 700 series. Moving on from the time of planting. Let's look at the fertilizer management program. Fertilizer, organic, inorganic. A question that most farmers always pose. Because we are moving towards an integrated approach, both are ideal. We just need to use them sparingly and with the desired result in mind. So for fertilizer management to be effective, 
you need to be guided by the universal principles of nutrient management, where you find that the right source should be factored in, where the right source can only come from your understanding of soil analysis. Because by just looking at your soil, I always have this argument with farmers, where they are saying, no, my soil is sandy, mine is clay, mine is, is clay loom, and they think we can give them a rate for their, PA, for, for their lime application based on the color of their soil. Rather, you should stand guided by soil analysis. Well, soil analysis is the only one which can tell you whether or not you need calcitic lime or dolomitic lime based on the nutrients that are in your soil. When you need to know the, all the other nutrients that are in your soil, you need to go the extra mile. You are not just testing pH only now. You also need to test for the full nutrient status of your soil so that you'll be able to make an informed decision. The right rates should be factored in. The fertilizer use efficiency comes into play. And also this is guided by the yield level that you're expecting. For example, if you want to be a member of the esteemed or highly uh, esteemed 11 ton plus club, you also need to make sure that your fertilizer program is well aligned. Are you choosing the right fertilizer rates and to be able to give you the desired level of yield that you want to get? So it's also important to be guided by that. The right time, we spoke about this, make sure you're applying the fertilizer at the right time. We always have an argument with farmers whereby they want to use the most commonly used fertilizer whereby they combine ammonium nitrate and compound D and, tell, and term the fertilizer compound X. Have you heard about it? Yes, we know too that farmers do that. But the only challenge is if you are going to come in with a fertilizer that was supposed to boost the root system to be able to uptake the nutrients and the, the much needed water to grow at a stage when the crop is now growing vegetatively, it means something is not right. You need to make sure that the fertilizer tallies with the time in which it's supposed to be used so that you get the optimum result from that particular fertilizer. So basal fertilizer is basal, as the name suggests. It should be used at planting or before planting so that it avails the much needed phosphorus. If you can check, most basal fertilizers come with a high level of phosphorus, which is to say it's the element that is most important and it's important why for root development. From that stage, we move to the vegetative stage, the flowering stage, and the other stages, depending on the crop that you have established. So it's important for you to make sure that the fertilizer is applied at the ideal time, the appropriate time for it uh, to, to be able to perform its desired, uh, its desired job and make the crop grow and make uh, your farming venture profitable. So compound X, we are saying no, it's a good fertilizer, high nitrogen, but you are going short of other elements that should be affected by the time you're applying that compound X that you come with, it's around six to eight weeks. So basal fertilizer is basal. Top dressing fertilizer, as the name rightfully suggests, is a top dressing fertilizer, which should come in at the vegetative stage of growth of the crop. By vegetative stage, we mean that the crop has finished establishment and, is, and, and, and emerging. It's now moving to the next level. It's now growing vegetatively vegetatively for it to prepare for the next level of growth, which is reproduction. So it's important for you to take note of that. Once this crop has reached vegetative stage, it needs an addition of nitrogen because it's the element that is responsible mostly for the growth of the crop vegetatively in preparation for other stages. So the dressing fertilizers, just to highlight, we have two main top dressing fertilizers, ammonium nitrate and urea. Ammonium nitrate in nature, is a fertilizer that is very mobile in terms of moving down in the, in the soil profile. The correct term is it, it, it will be leached if it's not applied. So it's important for you to note that ammonium nitrate, when you're using it, you need to split apply it, especially when you're going to be using it in soils that are loose, the sandy soils, sandy loamy soils, where the chances of it being leached are higher. So it's important for you to come in with split application on average, there are two split applications that a farmer can do in one cropping program. Say, for example, in a crop like maize. When you are going to be using AN as well, another important point is to make sure that you, you are also coming in when there's moisture in the soil. Because if you're going to apply it to dry soil, it's going to, to absorb moisture from your crop and your crop will wilt and you'll be found wanting. So don't apply AN based on the color of the clouds. You really need to make sure that the moisture is there in the ground 
so that when you apply your fertilizer, it will not be a risk factor to the crop. So that's another important thing. When you look at urea, urea in nature is a fertilizer that is also unstable. It's volatile. Volatility is the correct term. By volatility, we mean that if you apply urea on top of the soil on the ground, it will be taken into the atmosphere and you will be left with the innate material that is not going to benefit you with anything. So it's important for you when you're using urea to apply it on moist soils. Usually it's recommended on areas that are a bit swampy or when we are getting very high levels of rainfall so that it immediately dissolves and we get the benefit out of it. Sometimes you can come in with, you know, with advancements that are, are, are there nowadays. We find that there are new fertilizers that are there available on the market. Once you discuss with the agronomists from fertilizer companies, they'll go in detail with you on that. But what you should take note of today is the fact that there are some coated types of urea that you can use, that you can apply on the soil surface, and these ones will release the nutrient element that is required gradually during the course of the growing of the crop as it grows. There, as you can see on the picture with um, different shades of, uh, of, of, of a maize leaf, that is what can happen to your crop if you don't pay attention to nutrient management. A healthy crop is lush green, shiny, but a deficient crop, as you can see, phosphorus, the purplish color, potassium, the firing element, and the nitro nitrogen deficiency, the yellowing element that can come into play as well. So moving on, let's look at weeds. Weeds are a crop's worst enemy. Why? Because they compete with the crop for literally everything. They'll compete with the crop for space to grow. They'll compete with the crop for nutrients. They'll compete with the crop for the available water, which we said in the beginning of the presentation, because of climate change, might not be enough. So if there is competition introduced to an already strange situation, it will also add to the yield levels being reduced. So it's important for you to take note of the fact that weed management should be done and done timelessly. The first 10 to 12 weeks of the crop should be weed free, especially the first six to eight weeks. However, factors allowing at your farm, the crop should just be weed free until harvest because a clean field is attractive. A clean field will also be able to reduce the chances of you incurring losses at harvesting when you get admixtures or other things that can happen. So it's important for you to take note of that. Here besides selected sectors, here besides, they are one of the tools that were introduced to reduce back eggs. Did you know that? Once you use herbicides, they will re increase the efficiency of weed control only if it's done well. Herbicide management is guided by the following principles. The weed spectrum, the stage of control, rotation plan, and the cost. So it's important for you to take note of all these factors when you're selecting your herbicide, particularly your rotation plan. Because some farmers might come in and say, herbicides kill the soil because they will have applied probably a herbicide that is not in tandem with the proposed crop that is to come after harvesting of the crop that will be established. So it's important for you to take note of that, the fact that some herbicides will just last for three months, some five months, some 18 months in the soil. But you also need, you also need to make sure that you are moving with the times and you are also using herbicide technology. So the presentation is going to be cut off after 45 minutes. However, we urge you to join back again so that we continue with the, discussing the issues as we proceed. Moving on to the insect pests. There are some problematic insect pests in every crop. The important thing as a farmer is for you to make sure that you know the problematic insect pests before you even go to the field. Why do you need to find out? You need to make, do your research well in advance of establishing the crop and make sure that you find the desired, the desired product to deal with the problematic insect pests. For example, as you can see on your screen, there are different pro insect pests that are problematic, particularly when the crop is being established and in question, particularly the crop is based, being our staple crop. So it's important for you to take note of the fact that those are some of the problematic insect pests from the cutworms that cut at the base where the stem meets the ground to the white grubs. Particularly if you're going to use organic matter, we'll discuss it, uh, discuss it as we move forward. The four armyworm, as the name suggests, it moves in armies. 
So within a couple of days, it's not one of those pests that when you are doing cell phone farming, you hear about and wait to go after five days, there won't be a crop to recover. So it's important for you to be uh, timers in your response in terms of pest control. The most problematic pests in maize production, poor armyworm. The important thing in, in um, the correct control is to be able to identify the insect pest in question. With four armyworm, identification is important because stock borer is also still available. Pink bollworm is also available. So you need to make sure that you have done the correct diagnosis and you get the correct product for the particular problem. Also, it comes into play the issue of timeliness. When you come in during the stage when you have the hedged larva that you have seen on your screen, it means you can just squeeze the insect pest and kill them. But, or you can come in with um, different products like um, different insecticides that you can use, not going into details, but you can go check with your agronomist for the different names of agrochemicals that you can use. But you find that if, if, if uh, it's the first insta for four armyworm, you can control with a wider range of, of products rather than when it's the fourth insta, when clearly the pest is overgrown. For four armyworm control, these are the suggested products that you can use, bearing in mind that there are a wide range of products on the market. The important thing when you're picking a product from the market, know the active ingredient because you risk it applying three or four different products with different trade names, yet you're just applying one product with essence because it's the same active ingredient. So it's important for you to take note of that. Soil organic matter is important for you to take note of, especially when we are moving with the times and we want to be an integrated approach nation in terms of our agriculture. So it's important for you to talk, take note of the fact that organic matter is good, but when you are using it, you also need to understand the fact that you need to incorporate some good uh, management practices whereby you need the manure to be fully decomposed before you use it, if it's manure, and you also need to come in with insecticides where need be. The importance of mulching. In light of climate change, mulching is another topical issue. Applying mulch on your soil is important because it will provide the blanket cover that will be able to conserve the moisture, the much needed moisture that the crop desires to grow well. And it will also be able to suffocate the weeds, allowing for your crop to grow without much competition and also saving on your pocket because you, won't, you will probably not need to buy as much insect herbicides as you would have if you have left the ground without a well-mulched blanket cover. So it's important for you to take note of the fact that it's something that you should do. Water conservation and harvesting. Water conservation is important because climate change is real. So you really need to adopt moisture and water harvesting techniques in the form of tight ridges, pot walling, mulching, reservoirs, and wet dripping so that you become profitable and you bank the little moisture that you're going to get for future use and your crop is able to grow without stress for longer periods. Crop selection, the icing on the cake. Selecting a crop is important. I always argue with farmers when they are asking, which crop can I grow? It boils down to you having the ability to do your market analysis, market research first, before you even venture into any crop venture. Where will I sell this crop? Because if I tell you that sesame is paying well and you don't get the market, what benefit is that to you? So it's important for you to choose your crops wisely based on the market. Just before we move into the varieties, variety selection is important. But the different varieties on the market are guided by the following principles that you are seeing on your screen. The amount, distribution, length of the growing season, altitude, all the other factors that we were explaining will guide you in terms of variety selection. Looking at maize, which is our staple of food, we have a wide range of products that you can use from the 300 series to the 700 series. Your selection will be guided by the time that you need to but also take note of the fact that new genetics are now available on the market. So it's important for you to take note of that. We are kindly asking all participants to mute their devices, lest we get feedback and other, other participants will not be able to understand. So it's important for you to mute your device. So in the 400 series, our new flagship is SC419, while in the 500 series, triple five is a new flagship with very good tip cover, extra white kernels, and it has a high row number. 
very good drought, drought tolerance. So it is a blockbuster. 659 is another variety to reckon with. And in the 700 series, our traditionally high yielding 719 and 727 are available readily. They are now on the market, but you can contact your agronomist for further information or visit our website. In soya beans, we find that soya bean is another cash cow because it is an oil seed crop of importance. And the government is saying we need to establish as much soya bean as possible, even on a small scale. So these are the varieties that you can grow. Of note is SC spike, a variety that is yielding very high for different farmers in different localities. But you need to note that we have a wide basket, so there's product for every farmer. In the sugar bean product basket, there is SC bounty, SC sharp, the new varieties on the bucket are SC Gadra and Kukulinga. As you can see from the yield levels, they give higher yields. So you need to go for new genetics every time because they are improved with new technologies of higher yield and drought tolerance, as well as guiding your crop by having defensive agronomic traits. Who do not want to be like Gogosunga, smiling all the way to the bank at the end of the season? after establishing the small grain crop sorghum. So this can be done. We can establish your white sorghum or your red sorghum. SC Sila and SC Smile, they are available on the market and you can buy them. In the vegetable basket, as, as you rightfully know, Seedco is a one-stop shop. So if once you come in, you go with the seed package in terms of your seed. So we, had, we have a wide range of varieties for horticulture, but what I can just say is the fact that you need to choose your varieties wisely because you need to be guided by the nature of the season. The rainy season comes with diseases, comes with insect pests, so you need to stand guided. So we are left with one minute for us to conclude the first section of this presentation, but please join us as we go, go into the next session where we are going to move into question and answers and we'll go into detail on other issues that you might want be highlighted. We are left with one minute for this presentation to come to an end, but please, please, we invite you to join us as we proceed going forward. So just kind of wrapping it up before we move into the question and answer segment. Yield determinants. We have two main yield determinants. We have good agronomic practices and selection of the right seed. First, the right crop, then the right seed. So it's important for you to 